aligned with strong collaboration with partners from both private and development groups to provide required services and deliver results for every Nigerian. Once this is done, it is important to have a single, clear, coherent, People are leaving Nigeria because Nigeria has become inhabitable. We cannot go on. If Nigeria continues the way it is going today, Nigeria will be destroyed and we will not have any home to go to. Nigeria still remain our home and we must protect Nigeria at all costs. Thank you very much. What do you have to say to Nigerians who have lived in this country for years and yet they support and promote bad governance back home? Right, I will say to every Nigerian who does not support a credible candidate, however you think it, this thing happened in 2015 and we took it to be a politics. But today we have seen that everybody, if you cannot go home today because you are fearing of being kidnapped, you cannot go home today because you are fearing of being killed, terrorists and bandits are running all over the country today because nobody is doing anything about them. So if you think that you have a very safe heaven in United Kingdom, then you are dreaming because you yeah. cannot be here forever. Yeah. So you. make your choice today, and your choice will speak volume when that time comes. I'm going to, I'm going to add to that. Nigeria, you you asked a very, very good question. Listen, when people say people support bad governance back home, it all boils down to the one thing that will be at the same on day one, corruption. How do I benefit from this man's government? How do I get contract? from this man's government. I don't need no contract. I don't need no money in my pocket. I don't want to say something my brother here can tell you. I was approached here in London by the Bala Blue camp. I turned them down. Yeah, why can't? They came to me. I turned them down. You understand? And I said to the my friend who is the Leader. I said, listen, I wish him well, let him go and have the rest. Let able young Nigerians take Nigeria to the next level. So, Nigeria is a country where we have people always looking for somebody to give them handouts. If we have not anything here in this London, it's all man for himself. So, if you have a mind, to separate yourself from handouts, from those corrupt politicians. Say no to the contracts, to the events, to the houses, to whatever they offer you. And say, you want Nigeria to work for Nigeria. Nobody can force the money to your country. People only support something bad when they know what they're going to do. You understand? So if you put your interest first before Nigeria, you will definitely want to benefit and you don't care. But remember, you go home to Nigeria, you don't fly from the airport to your village. You will still, you still, you still fly the road, yeah? The potholes are there for you. Youth restiveness brings a lot of problems. You have highway robbers, you have people, assassins, you have uh, kidnappers. So if, the more you impoverish the people, the more you are creating the beast that will come to destroy Nigeria from within. That's what I'm Assistant development process. It is important for institutions to be able to provide strong leadership, coordination, capability, partner and engage collaboratively with all relevant stakeholders in an environment that mutually reinforces values. The second plank of our policy trust is to shift emphasis from consumption to production by running a production-centered economy that is driven by agrarian revolution and export-oriented industrialization. With about 70 million hectares of arable land, we will pursue an agricultural revolution through proper segmentation of Nigerian to activate and harness factor endowment of different parts of the country for both rapid and mechanized agricultural development and as a pillar for Nigerian other sectoral development and industrialization. We will incentivize and invest in an agro cluster 
and industrial cluster development across our geo resource zones to take advantage of agglomeration and scale effects, of particularly in the northwest, northeast, and north central regions of Nigeria. We will dredge both River Niger and River Benue, build dams massively to support planting of economic trees across the country for local usage, poverty and elimination, export and revenue generation. A key tax is to sequentially but decisively dismantle the inefficient and anti-market decisionary structures restraining Nigerian economy from creating a precondition for a dynamic pro-market economy, we will employ entrepreneurial governance to dismantle impediments to free trade and ease of doing business and implementing radical economic policies that will drastically reduce our debt service, a major drain to the government revenue as it is today. Our micro, small and medium scale enterprises will be robustly supported. Further borrowing must be strictly for productive purposes and not for consumption. While we aggressively pursue the activation of all opportunities in oil and gas value chain, we will target incentive schemes that will be professionally administered to diversify our non-oil export portfolio with proper consideration and management of climate change risk and opportunities. The third pillar of our government priorities is to restructure the polity through effective legal and institutional reforms to entrench rule of law, aggressively fight corruption, reduce the cost of governance, and establish honest and efficient civil service. Reducing costs of governance in Nigeria is an effective way of fighting institutional corruption. In addition to reducing the cost of governance and streamlining government operations for efficiency and effectiveness, we will ensure that reforms we, we pursue will in, not in any way affect the livelihood of our hardworking and efficient civil servants. Critical to fighting corruption, we will in, install a new budgeting system funded on a cardinal principle of public accountability, objective setting, and program implementation. This is against the extant budgetary principles of revenue mobilization, expenditure allocation, borrowing without emphasis on monitoring, evaluation, and feedback. We will enforce principle of performance, auditing, institutionalized monitoring, and evaluation process of the entire public service delivery as the primary means of actualizing our vision of the new Nigeria. This reform will institutionalize our personal involvement of both the president and the vice president in certain budgetary objectives of MDAs and monitoring, evaluating the implementation process through Office of Regulatory review in the office of the president. Budget monitoring and evaluation capacity will be strengthened within the presidency. We will embark on effective micro and physical restructuring to quickly restore physical viability by discontinuing unaffordable subsidies which have left a black hole in government finances. Physical and monetary policy will be coordinated with each conventional tool transparently instead of the certain markets in favor of privileged few. For instance, an avoidance of doubt, we will collaborate with Central Bank of Nigeria for a transparent liberalization of our foreign exchange market and this modeling of OPEC 
multiple exchange rates. Regime which effectively subsidizes few privileged persons. We will seek to boost the supply side rather than continue to concentrate exclusively on demand management of foreign exchange. When unaffordable subsidies are removed, some carefully calibrated transfers will be used to cushion adverse effect impact on economically weak. If the competitiveness of sector is to be enhanced, then we will do so via enactment of transparent and specifically target physical and trade policies designed to stimulate investment and growth. Revenue shortfalls and leakages such as oil theft will be dealt with decisively by holding persons in position of authority fully accountable. The fourth plank of our governance priorities is to lift frog into the fourth industrial revolution through application of scientific technological innovation to create digital economy. Building on the gains of agriculture-led manufacturing and export, we will pursue development of knowledge and skills to leverage on the emerging destructive digital technologies, automation, internet of things, artificial intelligence, robotics, virtual reality, blockchain technology, biotechnology, and data science, all of which are the heart of the fourth industrial revolution. The fifth plank of our government priorities is to build expansive infrastructure for its efficient power supply, rail, road, and air transportation, and pipeline network through integrated public-private partnership and entrepreneurial public sector governance. Our solution to the perennial power problem in Nigeria is comprehensive and it's well covered in our manifesto. We will ensure that we deal with the issue of transmission distribution. However, we will immediately complete the 2.3 billion Nigeria Siemens Network Improvement Deal to achieve a stable 7,000 by the end of this year, 11,000 megawatts by 2024, and 25,000 megawatts by 2025. We will support local manufacturing capacities and power technologies and encourage and expand local R&D in universities, training centers, and workshops through which many jobs will be created. Our sixth priority program is to enhance human capital development of our youth for productivity and global competitiveness through investment in education, in research, quality health, and entrepreneurial education. The World Bank Human Capital Development Index ranks Nigeria 168 over 173. To move Nigeria right to the top bracket of the index, we will pursue a Marshall Plan type program on education that incorporates compulsory technical and vocational skills, sports, entrepreneurship, programming, digital skills from primary to secondary school level. In line with this commitment to transform our educational sector, we will prioritize funding of this critical sector. Our tertiary institution will be remodeled to serve as hubs and centers of research development and commercialization of ideas for quick industrialization of Nigeria. Finally, our seventh priority is to conduct an Afrocentric diplomacy 
that protests the rights of Nigerian citizens abroad, advances the economic interests of Nigeria and Nigerian businesses in a changing world. In concluding, let me say that the problem with Nigeria is at once complex and simple. It rests on leadership. As our elder professor, Professor Chinua Achebe, stated, the trouble with Nigeria is simply and squarely a failure of leadership. In Achebe's view, there's nothing basically wrong with Nigerian character. The Nigerian problem is the unwillingness or inability of his leaders to rise to the responsibility, to, to the challenge of leading in the front by example, which is the hallmark of true leadership. When people of competence, character, commitment, compassion, take over the leadership and pursue their mission and task with seriousness required, a new Nigeria characterized by peace, unity, prosperity, inclusiveness will be achieved and sustained. That is what driving Dati, Baba Ahmed and I to join to offer to lead this desire and crusade of Nigerian, particularly the youth, for an inclusive and sustainable Nigeria that works for all. In line with my upbringing, especially my mother's counsel, my promise is that Nigerian resources will be most prudently used for Nigerians. And as Commander-in-Chief, I, Mr. Peter, will be sincerely pledge that our part with Nigeria will be diligently pursued to create a new Nigeria characterized by sustained and inclusive growth and development for all. Thank you, and God bless all of you. Peter, I don't know if you want to sit for a moment while we take a few questions. We'll take them in threes, or you can stay there as you wish. Yeah. Um, look, the, the, the first question, is, we have, uh, at the moment, the analytics are showing we have tens of thousands of people watching. So my apologies if you are on Facebook, YouTube, the Chatham House channel. Uh, uh, we can't take questions from you. On Zoom, we have hundreds of questions that have come in. Uh, one question is from Baba Femi Adibola, who said, uh, is asking the following question. Given the complexity of Nigeria's democracy and the Labour Party not projected to have the majority in the National Assembly, how would you work with legislators to ensure the radical reforms you are proposing come to light if you win the presidential election? So that's one question. Just hold that there. And I'm going to go right to the back of the room Right at the corner there, the gentleman right in the corner, yes, so, yes, you. Please go ahead, introduce yourself and one question, please. Thank All you. right, thank you. My name is uh, Ajiboye Tsumishi from Audersfield uh, University. So my question is simple. Uh, the activities of the IPOP in Nigeria is on alarmate every day. And with all the policy, beautiful ideas that you've listed down, sir, without tackling security at all, they are impossible. So one of the allegations given to you is that you've not condemned the activities of the high pop. So and the uh, tackling of security. Okay, can you sum up, please? Let me land. Shh, shh, shh. Tackling of security. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, let's Sorry, uh, give, I'm a student. We are to line. Tackling so, of sorry. security, how will you tackle it, sir? 
Are you introducing state? Please, please. Are you introducing state police, or are you threatening the federal government secu uh, security apparatus? Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I have a third, uh, another question that has come in, uh, which I want to ask there from our virtual audience, and it's from uh, Vivian Achekwezu who says, uh, who's asking the following. Uh, Vivian is asking, for many years Nigeria has underinvested in healthcare. What are your plans for achieving universal health coverage where access to healthcare is a right rather than a pri privilege, as well as ensuring sustained funding for epidemic preparedness and response? We did have a similar question for Mr. Tunubu in the, the last session that we did. So there are three questions there for you, Peter, and then I'll come through the audience here. Please just be patient. First question is how do you deal with the legislators considering that Labour Party is probably not in control of the legislative arm of the government. Quite frankly, I have been through this as a governor. When I was elected and sworn in as a governor, I have 30 House members, not from my party. In fact, nobody from my party was involved. As long as you are pursuing what is right, everybody will go with you because the legislator is insecure in his place. He knows that his people are without job. And that's what he wants. He wants development. What else is he like elected to do? It, is, it becomes a problem when you are pursuing transactional policies which will benefit you or you're engaging in nepotism where you have to but if you address it by strictly following the constitution which spells out that the system is characterized by simply that will have diversity and all is included and you did the right things you don't need to worry about that issue of IPOB, maybe you're not following me. Even yesterday, I spoke about Biafra being ended 53 years ago. It's all over the place in the space. I condemn all agitators, but in condemning them, you have to look at what brought about this agitation all over the place. It's not only IPOB. We have Yoruba Nation movement. We have all sorts. When you have created this level of massive poverty, where 63% of your population is poor, you're going to create all sorts of problems. I was speaking to a British minister this morning. I said we have about 40% unemployment. And we have about 60% youth unemployment. Young people in their productive age doing nothing. If you have 15% unemployment in Britain today, you're going to have massive, remember, agitation. Nobody will be able to leave his house. So what you have seen is a cumulative effect of leadership failure over the years, which will be solved by good governance. When people start seeing justice, fairness, an inclusive government and doing the right thing, all those things will start reversing itself. And that is what me and that is offering. I will talk and discuss with all agitators. There's nothing wrong in that. People agitate even in my house, and I talk with them. So I'll deal with everybody. I'll show you of that. Don't worry about that. On the issue of health, yeah. yes, we have a problem with health. We have underinvested, and because our government have not prioritized our development agenda, everybody knows that the only measure of development that is recognized globally today is Human Development Index. And this is hanged on three items, life expectancy, which is health. And we are low in that. Nigerian life expectancy today is about 50 something, as against the global average of 72. So we are low. Same in education. So it's to prioritize that. I just gave somebody an example. 
in the past five years, from 2015 to 2021, Nigerian budget in health is under 2.5 trillion naira for 200 million people. It's unacceptable. Even this year, our budget for health is about 1.5 trillion. Our budget for education is about 2 trillion. Two of them combined, annual budget is about 3.5 trillion. When your six month budget for subsidy, which is a criminalized, <laughs> listen, it's 3.6 trillion, it's unacceptable. You have to put money in key development areas, as Professor Dutton has just mentioned, and I read out here, that what separates country rich and poor is health and education. So it's clear. So we will deal with it. But he said, how do you cover it? Nations of our size have covered it. How did India, for 1.4 billion people, cover the issue of health? How did Indonesia cover that? We have big nations that have done it well. If we don't know how to do it, we learn from them. There's nothing wrong in learning if you don't know how to do it. <laughs> I'm going to take more questions. Now, there is someone who has such a strong arm. Their arm has been up for 15 minutes. <laughs> now, I'm not going to say that's criteria for taking question next time. But, madam, you get the, the question. That you have the strongest arm in the audience. Um, Please introduce yourself. One question. Thank you so much. Good afternoon and welcome, sir. My name is Priscilla Winkbo, um, and I'm an independent broadcaster here in London. And, sir, you spoke about your point number five, which is to generate electricity and power in Nigeria. And you spoke about transmission, distribution, and generation. But I think it's fair to say that our problems with power goes beyond those three areas. And the main problem that I see here is this. We have um, a population or part of the economy, shall we say, those who supply spare parts, the engineers, those who work within that sector, whether it's those that are selling um, um, generators. And we know that that issue is perhaps the biggest issue when it comes to our power generation. So my question here is this. How do you plan, number one, and I'm going to take a risk here, to deal with the big boys and how do you also plan to address that economy that will then no longer exist because you have generated power? Because I'm sure that they too will rise up um, against it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We did uh, online have lots of questions about refining also. And so this is a key issue that people are asking questions about. So the gentleman there, a bit further along. Yes, there, you, just there, yeah. Please go ahead, introduce yourself. Thank you very One much. Question. <clears throat> Good to see you, Peter. And Paul Arkwright, I was the British High Commissioner to Nigeria from 2015 to 2018. And it's good to see you in London, sir. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I, I've now moved into private business. I'm a consultant and I'm advising companies uh, and funds, investors to uh, look at Africa, to look at Nigeria, to consider investing there, and everyone agrees, I think, that FDI, foreign direct investment, is critical to the future of Nigeria. But they, at the moment, they're very cautious, uh, and that's putting it diplomatically. <laughs> <laughs> if, when uh, you become president, uh, sir, could you tell me the, the sort of three things you would do in the first, let's say, 100 days? Um, which would encourage, which would send the right signal to foreign investors to look again at Nigeria, not just look again at Nigeria, but to invest in Nigeria. Because as you know, uh, I'm one of Nigeria's strongest supporters, and I think this is a country which is worth investing in. Thank you. Okay. 
And I will come back to this side, the gentleman just there, you sir, just there. No, 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 behind, sorry. You're the lucky one. Uh, one question, short, please give your name. Uh, good evening. Um, it's William Mawamayi, the UK's young ambassador to the Commonwealth and a member of Chatham House. Uh, you've caught Nigerian by storm in recent months with your campaign and your vision to unify Nigeria, right. mobilising young people all across the country. Uh, you mentioned debt a few times in your speech. Currently, the government is repaying debt at, uh, to the central bank at an interest rate of 19.5%, which is extremely high. How do you plan to support the, the next is, generation? The government is paying? Repaying the central bank debt by 19.5% interest rate. How do you plan to support the next generation by dealing with the debt repayment crisis? And also, how do you plan to deal with tackling financial transparency in Nigeria? The central bank has released, hasn't released its balance sheet in about three years. Thank you. There you go, Peter. Three questions. Let me start with, the, with my sister there. He talked about the big... What, what you're saying is about the big boys who are selling generators. <laughs> let me assure you... Let me assure you what we've been campaigning on. Our campaign... You have heard them say we don't have structures. That is the structure we're trying to destroy. Structure of criminality. That is what I mentioned. That Nigeria has been held captive. That structure is structure that impoverished Nigeria. We will dismantle it. It will not be there. I assure you of that. We're going to turn around the power sector. Nigeria generates about, today, 56,000 megawatts of electricity for 200 million people. And South Africa, the second biggest in terms of economy in the five continent. Five to six thousand. Five, five, five to six thousand, that's been five to six thousand, sorry. And South Africa, the second biggest economy, 60 million people generates about 40 to 50,000. And South Africa in the past three months have declared emergency in power and said anybody can generate up to 100 megawatts without license. So somebody who is 60 million, generating about over 40,000, declared emergency. What do you think somebody with 2 million people generating 5 to 6,000 would do? War. I'm going to declare war on power, and I'll solve it. Anybody who stands on the way, so be it. Bringing back foreign investor is very simple, poor. Foreign investor is like bee and honey. All you need is to create honey. The way B will find the place is very simple. <laughs> Foreign capital is scared of corruption. Is scared of board policies. Is scared of where there's no rule of law. You need to put a regulatory environment that makes it conducive. You need to secure it. That is at the heart of what Dati and I are offering. We will build that intangible assets of securing the country, making sure that we govern to rule of law. We will fight corruption. That they have a record that is the only National Assembly member who refused to buy property of government when it was offered to all National Assembly members. You can go and look at this record. If you have seen anywhere he has compromised or put himself in a transactional position. And I'll stop running. I know how I approached him. And I told him, I and you owe it to save our people. That's why we came together. And we came back and said, we'll work as a team. We'll solve this problem. Go and check my record. I've governed the state for eight years, and I've challenged everybody. Paul, you were there. I've been the only governor. Till today, the day I left office, 
I was not owing salary, pension, gratuity, or any contract or any supplier. And I left the three banks in Nigeria, which I say every day. Access Bank of Nigeria, Fidelity Bank of Nigeria, and Diamond Bank, I left hundred of, over $150 million. Dollars, I didn't say Naira. And I have over 30 billion Naira. And an Anambra State, you can go and verify, you know. I've never had a bottle. Anambra State have never bought me. There's no land allocated directly or indirectly by me, and I signed over several thousands of CFO. Anambra has never bought me a bottle of water since I left office. <laughs> so you can go. We will fight and stop corruption. Yeah. The first thing about stopping corruption is yourself. If you're not involved, your wife is not involved, your family is not involved, those around you are not involved, you reduce it by over 50%. Yes. And that's what I'm going to do. And I'm sure, Paul, you know that. We are committed. We can't disappoint these youths. We must build a new Nigeria. Yes. And we'll deal with that. Investors will come back. Those who left, even the young people who are today living, they'll come back. Yes. We want to bring them back. Nigerians are prepared to come back if they can find that they have a country to go back to. This green passport, people must be proud to use it. Yes. On issue of capital, where do you find money? My young brother, there's nothing wrong in borrowing. Borrowing is a legitimate way of every, every government I've studied in the world borrow. Even Britain, as we speak, owns over 70% of their GDP. Every government I know lives on borrowing. Even Norway, with 1.4 trillion sovereign world, is owing. The economies of the world, the third biggest nation in the world is America. The debt of America today is almost 100% of their GDP. The second, China, is almost owing over 60% of their GDP. Japan owes 200, over 230% of their GDP. But let me tell you the difference. Japan is owing over 230% of their GDP. They invested the money to save their economy. And in that, even with that, Japan is still the highest holder of US treasuries. So there's something they can fall back on. What has happened? So borrowing is not wrong. If I have done, I compare two countries that borrowed with Nigeria and how well they've done. But what has happened is that when you borrow for consumption, you have a crisis. Nigeria borrowed for consumption. Nigeria in 2015 had a GDP per capita of $2,550. And they were owing about 15 billion, 15 trillion naira. Today, with central bank ways and means, we are owing over 75. So we have grown that debt by about 400%. But our per capita is 2,000. That means that the money we borrowed was thrown away. So that is what I'm going to revert. We will restructure the debt as it is today. We will restructure it and put it a long time to be able to pay it. I'm a finance person, that is one. And then we will not say, like I said here, no more borrowing for consumption. We'll see borrow, people will see it, it will be transparent, it will be for investment. And that's what we intend to do. Countries have been in this situation before. We're not in a, a situation where other countries haven't passed before. It's a question of showing leadership and we will be able to solve it. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm coming back. We are now uh, almost around 60,000 people just watching us and sending in questions. So we're trying to be at least a bit inclusive. Um, we have a question from uh, Debo Adimoyo, who is asking, what are your policy ideas on climate change? Do you have a plan for ensuring sustainability in a new government? So that's one question. Then there was a joint question from Miss Etty and Zindi Anthony Levy, and they're asking, insecurity is a major problem. What are your plans in tackling this? What are your plans in terms of security sector reform in Nigeria? Um, I'm going to take two more physical questions in the room. The lady right in the front here, so I'm... Um, 
I'm not going to uh, discriminate with the front rows. Please go ahead. Thank you. My name is Chi Chikwendu. I'm a practicing solicitor here, advocating, of course, for rule of law. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, for the inspiring exposition on your vision for policy change and institutional reforms. It seems to me that it's clear from that if elected president, if and when elected president, your transformation vision to increase the production capabilities across the various sectors mentioned, including agriculture, extraction industries, human resources, will, to a large extent, hinge on the depth of your level of commitment with um, Sadati and ownership to implement the proposed policy changes and institutional reforms. However, it's not, there is no doubt in my mind that Your Excellency is well aware of the prevailing fundamental challenges to, to those um, reforms, including clientele patronage, political capture, and the institutionalized um, corruption that you mentioned. So the question is, how do you intend to navigate these challenges differently from the efforts of previous administrations, particularly with a view to modifying the, the behaviors of the key players in support of achieving those anticipated outcomes. And I was very warmed when you mentioned your broadening the scope of youth inclusion and women uh, um, based on gender issues. So further, how do you intend to quell the current ethnic tensions ravaging our communities and consequently stagnating economic growth and development and to implement a pragmatic mechanism for dealing with those societal concerns for Equal. Okay, please, please, please. We, we, we need. The longer this takes, the less questions. Madam, please, yes. now. So, so, the question there is how do you intend to implement a pragmatic mechanism for dealing with those societal concerns for equal access to the services, inclusive participation, and in integrating? In the various thank you very groups. much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Peter, if you answer those questions, because uh, that, was, that was more than one question. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me start with the issue of, uh, you have, like you said, you have more than one question. I have about two questions. Let me start with the issue of ethnic tension. The ethnic tension you see today is based and as a result of injustice, unfairness, exclusion, marginalization, as, as soon as you start reversing that, they start going down. That is what I said to young man about agitation. As long as you start doing the right things, as long as you start building an inclusive society where people's talent, hard work, will match up their opportunity, you start seeing those things go down. There's tension, even in the Western world, yeah. They are leave the, are leave the air when the blacks feel excluded. But as the more the government opens up and tolerates and builds an inclusive, transparent, more broad-based, acceptable, they will come down. And we will show, I've said before, we will show compassion. We will show love. Because there's nothing, you're a leader. Don't, don't go away when Bahasa is under the water. Don't leave Jigawa to die. Don't say, oh, I cannot go to Southern Kaduna because there's a problem. Don't. We will show compassion. We will live from the front. We're not going to walk away. And for me, Boronu is part of Nigeria. I don't want to say people, oh, the room is in reduce the barriers for, for, for um, free enterprise. Because at the end of the day, Nigerian and entrepreneurial people, it does not make sense that as entrepreneurial people, our government is the biggest um, 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 advocate against our entrepreneurship. So as soon as, they, as soon as we start to work on these things, I think we will begin to become better as a country. And I think only Peter Obi has the, has the mandates and the ideas that are sufficient enough to change this country. Thank you, thank you. No problem. Secured. Nigeria is insecure. Like I told the IDP people in Christmas, I spent my IDP, with IDP people in Makode in Christmas. And in New Year was another IDP camp in Abuja. And I said to them, as long as Nigerians are in IDP, 
all of us are in IDP. I will not allow, and I know that you will not allow it, for any Nigerian to remain in IDP while we're sleeping yeah. in our mansions. Never. They must go back. <laughs> On issue of challenges and dealing with them, the challenges you foresee are there with such challenges at the Anambra level. And I'll show you the same challenges. We're not going to, as long as you're not involved in this transactional governance, you can deal with anybody. And we're not going to compromise. We have an issue, I said, we have an existential threat that we don't need to. There's nobody, there's no secret cow. You either be a Nigerian or you can find another country. We have a, have a country with the rule of law. It will be the same level playing field for everybody. I want to solve the problem. For example, I said it without equivocation. I must pull out the poverty that is devastating the north. The vast land in the north is far more in terms of assets and source of revenue generation and exports for Nigeria than the oil. It's very simple. If, and I give you an example of one state that I use every day. Niger State is 76,000 square kilometers. Precisely 76.3 thousand square kilometers of land. Seven local governments in that state is under control of bandits. I've tried to interview them because they have no job. They have nothing and everything. Niger State is two and a half times the size of Netherlands. And Netherlands agricultural export last year was $120 billion. Why can't Niger State do 5% of that? <laughs> they have a rebel land. And all they get from the revenue, from the sharing, which is the consumption, is less than 50 billion naira. When they have minus their debts and everything, if they earn 6% of, 5% of that, it's 6 billion dollars. At 650, it's about 4 trillion. 80 times what they get from here. We will change it. <laughs> Somebody talked about tackling insecurity. I've said it extensively. It is our first commitment to first secure Nigeria. Securing Nigeria is not impossible. A secured Anambra state has gone. And it won't be different. I said we will deal and talk with those. We will win. We will talk with those who are winnable. It will be carrot and stick. And those who don't, we will deal with them. We're not going to shy away. Nigeria must be secured. It's their country. Every country must be secured. But we cannot, we are not going to walk away from the problem. We'll deal with it. We have, our armies and military used to secure Africa. So this is time to go back and resonate that spirit in which they used to secure Africa to secure Nigeria. And we will deal with it. <laughs> On climate change, I've always said we'll follow the protocol. And I did mention here about issue of things like planting trees, issues of dredging. These are some of the climate change issues because as you see today, we have a situation where our flooding in Nigeria because we've not dredged River Niger, River Benu and everything. And I said it consistently. This is not difficult. We've awarded contracts for it in the past. Today, every Egypt will tell you, Egyptian will tell you, no Nile, no Egypt. They have used it to improve the water transportation, which dredging this one will do. And that's a long fighting climate change. They've used it for other means, which we will use the same River Niger and River Benue to do. River Niger and River Benue combined is, River Niger is 4,200 kilometer long. River Nile is 1,400. River Benue is 1,400 long. So two of them are 5,600. Nile is 6,000, 
650. If Egypt, an African country, come to the edge, maintain Nigeria is big enough to deal with this, and we'll deal with it. And I assure you, you see the difference. It will be clear. Other protocols of climate change will follow it. Where we find difficult, we'll negotiate and talk with other involved in that. We are signatory to it, and it's devastating the world today. So we must follow the protocol. Thank you. The, the clock is ticking. We're on. <clears throat> We're on borrowed time now, but we are going over, as I said. Um, so uh, there's right at the front here, there's a gentleman there. I'm going to take three questions, and then I think the clock is going to have uh, had its say. Short and sharp, please, I'll go ahead. I'll keep it short. Hi, um, good afternoon. My name's Alexis Akwajiram. I'm the managing editor of Seven for Africa. My question is, if you become the next president, would you seek to keep the current central bank governor or replace him? And please, ex and please explain your answer. So, the, the gentleman in the middle there. Yeah. Please. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon and thank you for your remarks. Uh, my name is uh, Chibwikem Ugongadi. I'm his master's student at King's College London. And it's funny, actually, my question is related to him. Um, given the debacle at the central bank currently and their conduct over the past eight years, what is your view on central bank independence as a, measure, as a tool to um, improve economic growth? And how will you instill what will you do about the leadership at the central bank when you become president in order to make sure that their principles are in line with yours on monetary policy? Thank you very much. Uh, the lady over there. Yes, madam, you. Yes, but, but sharp, please. There, there, there's a microphone just here. It is next to you. Just there, please. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, Your Excellency, um, good afternoon. So my question here is this. You talked about restructuring. As you're aware, Nigeria can barely service its, ex its, its external debt. Nigeria can barely service its external debt, our current external debt. We cannot service it, or we're finding, we're finding it difficult to service it. Now, when you become president, how do you intend to restructure our external debt without actually downgrading, downgrading our rating? in the market. Thank you. Thank you. And your name? Just so My we have it. My name is Umunakwe. Okay, okay. Thank, thank you. you. And then if we move the microphone to the, the lady just there. Last question. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Um, nice to see you again, Mr. Obi. My name is Kenneth Chikuwabo. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Cambridge. I study public-private partnerships in education. Um, I read your manifesto and it seems PPPs are taking a central stage in education sector. So I wanted to ask, what is your rationale for involving private actors in public education? And what governance structures would you put in place to ensure the accountability of these actors in a sensitive sector such as education? Thank you. Thank you very much. My apologies. We've run out of time now. I'm watching the clock. <laughs> Okay. Alex, I hope you will allow me that somebody here that is so keen, when I was coming in, he had a question that is so interested and is like, so I told him if I have opportunity, I will request and answer it publicly. Okay. Let me again go, people are talking about the central bank government. The problem, first, let me assure you, Central Bank go will maintain its independence. It will be respected. And again, it is not the problem of the person there. Central Bank have a role of monetary policy, if I'm right. Then you have this physical space. It's like a, a street football. When the person who is supposed to be in the physical space is no longer, it's like you go to a, fo a football match and the, somebody who is supposed to be playing a particular wing is no longer there. You find people playing various wing. The weakness of the physical space allows the monetary space to take over and in supporting 
because there's a weak governance structure. That is why we're able to do what we're doing. We are with, with what is happening today is happening. So if you replacing Godwin and putting somebody with that level of rascal, physical rascality, yes. mm. which is what is fueling our inflation and even our rate of exchange today, you know, these are some of the things you need to court. As long as the government continues on that fiscal rascality, that situation will occur. That's what you need to fix. I won't say what will happen. Step is actually coming to an end. So it won't be too long. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's, that's that. I assure you that we'll deal with that. You asked about PPP in education. I said you informed in Cambridge. Is Cambridge run by British government? No, I just want to know, because I don't know. <laughs> when we're talking about PPP in education, we're talking about tertiary education. We're not talking about basic education. We will ensure that basic education is free and we will drive it aggressive because we have 20 million out of school children in the north. Could you have said I'll deal with we will deal with decisively? Because those children mostly have learned Quran, which means they're intelligent. We will meet them at the point of learning Quran and teach them skill. For the tertiary education, we must find a way to fund it in a collaborative way, public partnership, in order to be able to ensure that four years will be four years, not what is happening today. That's what we mean by that. And it will be, you'll see, it's a win-win situation. That's the basic, sir. That's it. No, not the basic. It won't be the basic. Then, issue of barely servicing our debts. We're not, I've said it before, we're not the only country that have gone through this. Once we move from consumption to production, what we're going to do first is that what you see today, we're not able to service our debts, is because of physical rascality. You're paying on sustainable subsidy, which will be stopped from day one, because it's criminal thing. You're no longer generating money because they're st stealing oil. Here. And the only people who can steal oil are people in, in government, because ordinary people cannot steal oil. You can't put it in your pocket. <laughs> it's something that you come with sheep. So all those. And you stop corruption, the waste, everything. And you go to seek to ensure that the revenues of government are properly collected. These are things, when you have tightened all the leakages and waste, you'll be able to increase your position and you negotiate and be able to service them. Look at it, just to give you an example. Nigeria is today the only non, the only OPEC nation, apart from Venezuela, because of first sanction, that is not meeting up its quota. Because over the years of oil theft, the most nationals and everything have not been investing, coupled with the theft and everything. You're not realizing what you're supposed to. Every other nation that is in the same condition was able to bring down their rates and inflation within this period of Ukraine war. I'm not saying it's good to wait for war to be able to get more revenue, but people are taking advantage of it, you know, because it's there. And you can't run away from it. But we couldn't take that advantage. Our situation got worse because of poor management of our own physical space, which will change without an eye. And finally, like I said, Somebody said, to kept telling me that issue that uh, people have been saying that if I become president, that I'll be, that there's 
issue of being, uh, how do I say, what word do they use? Stingy. Stingy. <laughs> Pat knew the question of stingy. How are you going to manage because they said you'll be stingy and everything? And let me say it publicly that people don't know what it is all about. At the heart of poverty is capital formation. And you can't go about capital formation without savings. Even in the most developed world, which is why I say that Japan owns holds highest amount of US treasure. If you listen or you go and read about what Professor Ragnar Nask done in the 50s, he showed it clearly. Capital formation is at heart of poverty. Without capital formation, you have low productivity, low income, and you produce poverty all over the place. What I was doing as governor, I was the best governor in Millennium Development Goals by the UNDP. You can go and check that. Is that I, had a, I won a prize for the best road network. I won the gay prize back to back on health. You can go and see what I did in health. Build scratch, teaching hospitals and everything. Improved number one in education. And above all, I was able to save because I believe in future generation. If you look at that savings, I said future generation funding because we want to have proper capital formation to drive tomorrow. If I have opportunity in Nigeria, no matter what we do, we'll do the same thing. We must save for tomorrow. Yes. Because that's how you form capital to turn around tomorrow. <laughs> so as the end, I appeal to all of you, there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time have come. Victor Hugo. The time today is to have competent leadership with character, commitment and compassion. And that's what Nigeria is yearning for. That's what I, Dati and I are offering you. Let's have opportunity to build a better Nigeria. Thank you. announcements. First of all, INEC Chair speaking here tomorrow, same time, one o'clock. You're welcome. It's also going to be live streamed. NNPP presidential candidate Wednesday, same time. And finally, again, just to thank Peter Obi for coming to Chatham House. And uh, good luck in your campaign. And please, if you can just remain um, seated or on the side while Peter Obi Leaves. Thank you very much and have a good afternoon. Okay. What do you, an election or the deadline is just a few days, what do you have to say about that? Okay, um, first of all, I have to also say that uh, I know they are trying, in as much as we still expect more from them. We want them to do their best. We do not want them to be seen as compromised by any of the political uh, uh, aspirants, right? So we believe. DJ TV. DJ TV. DJ TV. Some of the delegates are asked the question. 
Thank you.